Hi guys, welcome to a new video. If you don't know me, my name is Maya, I hate tomatoes, and today we're talking about 10 things that I wish I knew when I started cooking. So I am a completely self-taught home cook. I've never been to any sort of culinary school, so I've taught myself from friends and family, from a lot of cookbooks, YouTube, TV shows, trial and error, you name it, I've tried it. <laughs> uh, but now we're doing it for quite a few years and I feel like I've learned quite a lot of stuff during my culinary journey, if you will. Uh, and I feel like I'd like to share it because if you're starting cooking it could be very... it could be a lot and it could be quite scary and in the beginning you do make a lot of mistakes. So here are my 10 tips on what you can do straight away from the gate to become a better home cook. Let's go. Number one, cook according to season and learn how to substitute locally. So since we now live in a very globalized world, we're getting inspirations from lots of different type of regional cuisines and techniques. And a lot of the time, something that might be available in Australia in August is not available in Sweden in August. So my first tip is to learn what is available when in your region and try to cook within that. This will both save you money because it's usually cheaper to be able to buy stuff actually in season where you are. It's also better for the environment so you're not buying a bunch of stuff that has to be shipped really far and lots of preservatives have to be used to keep them okay for you to be able to use it. Also, it will save you a lot of pain in the butt because half of the time it's stuff that might not even be available in your region. So it's also good to learn how to substitute. For example, different cuts of meat have different names and get butchered in some different ways depending on where you are. So for example, pork belly, that's super common in the US, is not actually a cut in Sweden. But we have a similar cut that we can make use in pretty much the same way. So learn what your region has to offer and work with that. A lot of time you can play quite a bit with different substitutes. Also, it's really good to be able to support local businesses so you keep that great business in your country. So number one, shop according to season and what's available in your area. Number two, when to be precise and when to go by feeling. This kind of is a division between baking and cooking because one requires quite a lot more of precision. So when you're baking, you're almost always gonna be as precise as possible. There are some areas where it's fine to do more or less, but to get a more exact result every time, we want to be weighing our ingredients. The best thing you can do is get a little small kitchen scale they're usually not that expensive at all and then you'll be able to get a similar result every time. And this way you'll also be able to know when stuff goes wrong, what it depends on. If you know you've weighed everything perfectly, then you know it's not the measurements that are wrong. Cooking, on the other hand, doesn't require precision to that level. Of course, when we're talking about food safety stuff, like uh, temperatures we're cooking stuff to, how we're handling certain produce, and then we need to be precise, but actual measurements in the cooking, it's a lot of trial and error and feeling your way out. But when you start cooking, I would actually advise you to use exact measurements even in cooking. Because this way you'll be able to learn, so by time you'll be able to eyeball how much two tablespoons of olive oil is. So a great way to do this is by buying measurement cups. So we have the American ones with cups, and then we have the normal ones <laughs> with deciliters and stuff. It's also good to get a nice measuring uh, cup, is that what it's called, that has the liquid measurements too. These are great, usually very cheap to get. Then with time, you're going to be able to play around a little bit, see what happens if you add a little bit more. You're going to be able to see how much stuff needs. But I recommend start with measuring a little bit more. But again, it doesn't have to be weight-based. Number three, 
get to know your oven slash stove slash hob. So how our actual ovens and stoves and hobs work can vary a lot. Are they fire driven? Are they gas driven? Electrical? Uh, do you have an un induction one? They can vary quite a lot and also depending on where how old it is, where it's placed, they can vary quite a lot. So when you move from different places it's going to take a little time to get to actually know your stove and oven. Most ovens and hobs will have some hotter spots and some cooler spots so learning how yours actually likes to behave will save you a lot of pain when you're burning stuff or when things cook evenly. A great tip is for your oven to actually get an oven thermometer because a lot of time a lot of ovens don't actually keep the heat that you turn it to. So a great way to be precise in your cooking is to get an oven thermometer, usually pretty cheap. You just install it and you actually know how hot it is. For example, my oven, the back is so much hotter than the front, so usually stuff will cook pretty unevenly. And this is a pretty new oven, so... So definitely get to know your hob slash stove and your oven, cause they have personalities and the quicker you get to know them, the better your results will be. Number four, read the whole recipe. So uh, I'm still, I'm gonna be honest, I don't always do this and I wish I did because a lot of times I'll see a recipe and be like, oh, I want to try it, I start reading it, but I don't read it through. And what will happen is I will realize, oh, this is gonna take a lot more time than what I thought. Other times, especially if it's a digital recipe, uh, maybe on Instagram or somewhere, I'll notice that an ingredient is listed that then it doesn't say in the recipe when you should incorporate it, or vice versa, it says to add an ingredient that wasn't listed. So the best way is to really read the recipe thoroughly before starting so you know exactly what is going to happen and when, what you're going to need through the whole process so you can plan accordingly. So definitely read the recipe all the way through before even deciding to actually make it. Number five, season. So I think a common mistake when you start cooking is that you'll only season maybe in the start, like you're putting on rice and you put the salt in it, or you only do it in the end. What you actually want to be doing is seasoning every step of the way. You need to keep on tasting what you're cooking and adjusting the season and adjusting the seasonings accordingly. It's super easy to forget it. I still sometimes will forget and realize oh, I should have seasoned this more. It's also good to know that usually sauces should be seasoned more heavily if the starches don't take too well to seasoning since it's gonna mix it out. So you need to be tasting things together. You need to be just season, season, season. You can always adjust. Of course, don't salt too much because it's it's sometimes it's annoying to reverse but adding a little bit at the time work until you find the perfect spot definitely recommend season we eat too much under seasoned food and it's not good you're worth more than that number six be reasonable know your limits and outsource i think it's really important as a home cook to actually know your limits what can i do what can't i do of course we want to evolve, we want to learn new stuff, but sometimes you don't need to do it. You're not working in a fabulous restaurant where you need to know everything to make it perfect. And a lot of the times these are stuff that we can get done by the professionals to low to no cost. If you are doing fish fillets, get the fillets or get your fishmonger to fillet it for you, you don't necessarily have to do it. Let's say you're making steak tartare. Sure, you could ground the meat yourself, or you can ask your butcher to do it. They have the actual equipment, they'll be more than happy to help, and they can also recommend a cut for you. We don't need to be experts in everything, and a lot of time it will save us both time and hassle if we get someone else to do the jobs. And also it can save us money because if we're doing something wrong then we maybe can't eat the food and then we're just wasting it and that's not good for your wallet, for your mind and not for the planet. So know your limits, know when you need to ask for help. Maybe you could have a friend that is better at something than they can teach you 
but always committing to try new things all the time might not always lead to success. Trust me, I know. <laughs> Number seven, mise en place. This one is a true classic, but I feel like you can't say it too much. It is the best way to cook. You need to prep, especially when you're learning. A lot of the things that actually take time is the food prep. So basically, if you don't know what mise en place means, it's everything has its place and that you should prep everything before. So when you're actually cooking, you can just like grab your bowl there, put it in, do, 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 do. Everything is where it's supposed to be, which makes it easier to combine later on. And when you're a beginner chef, a lot of the things that actually take time is the prep. So it's the cutting the vegetables, preparing the meat, finding the spices in your cabinet. If you prep all this before you start adding heat and combining stuff, it will be much easier and you can actually see what's happening and you don't have to be like running around with a hen without its head. We want to be smart when we're cooking and mise en place is the easiest way to do so and it doesn't have to be fussy, you can just section stuff off on your cutting board. Everything has its place, You, if you have some small bowls use that but it makes it a lot easier and it's also a great way to see if you're missing something because a lot of time if you're just cooking as you go you maybe miss something important. But this doesn't mean that you can't be doing stuff at the same time. In the beginning when you're cooking, you probably should stick to doing one moment at the time. But when you start learning more, you get some experience, you're going to be able to multitask. <laughs> nice one of a frog. <laughs> but as you go, you'll be able to learn how to multitask and it will be become much easier. So mise en place, everyone in the class, mise en place, great. Number eight, learn your staples by heart. Let's make this into an exercise. I want you to close your eyes and you're gonna visualize your three favorite meals that, yeah, actually just visualize your three favorite meals. So for me, that's meatballs with mashed potatoes, sauce and peas. It's pea soup, green pea soup, and I mean, a bunch of mine are pasta dishes, but I can't eat pasta anymore, so that's sad. But let's let's do the two, okay? I know how to make these in my sleep. And you should too, because if you learn some of your favorite dishes, those days when you're just tired, you've had a long day at work, or at school, you just want some food, you walk into the store, you're tired, you're hungry, you should just know what you need, you should know what you have at home, and you can get home and you just need to make it. You don't need to look up a recipe, you don't have to think too much, you can just do it on like autopilot. These should be the first things you learn so you know how to make them again and again and again and it's so thankful just to have a few of your favorite basics that you always know how to make no matter the situation, no matter how tired you are. Preferably these dishes are stuff that don't require too many ingredients, don't need any specific equipment, uh, and also are just food that makes you happy. These are usually super easy to memorize because they have a special place in your heart and you should be able to make them in your sleep. So I definitely recommend learn your absolute favorite staples by heart. Number nine, learn how to minimize food waste. So when I started cooking, I would usually take on quite big projects that res result in quite a lot of food and a lot of the time half left ingredients that maybe I've opened a jar of something or I've used half of a vegetable that I then don't know what to do with. So when you start cooking try to plan your meals very consciously so you're minimizing your food waste. When you're minimizing your food waste you're saving money, you're saving time, you're saving the labor that goes into producing these food for us and it's better for the environment if we actually use what we have. So when you're cooking try to use the whole of everything. Don't cook more than what you're going to eat. I know a lot of people don't like to eat too many stuff on repeat. So don't make bigger portions than what you're actually going to eat because otherwise you're just throwing it away. 
use your freezer. You can freeze so much stuff. I think I've talked about this before, but I love my freezer. Uh, since I'm usually just cooking for myself, a lot of time I'll get leftovers. Throw it in the freezer, I'll eat it in a couple weeks again. It's fine. So really try and minimize the food waste. Try when you're planning, maybe your food for the week, make sure you're reusing ingredients. So if, if you have a half zucchini for dish number one, you've planned a dish number two for the other half. I can also recommend if you don't already do this, just try to always have some pantry staples at home. For example, uh, rice, lentils, pasta, stuff like this is great because then when you have a bunch of half open stuff in the fridge you can combine it have it with some rice and it's usually pretty decent so yeah try to be conscious in what you're buying and using them to their full potential finally tip number two of stuff that i wish i knew when i started cooking don't stress it takes time and you're doing fine i didn't mean for that to rhyme that was a bit cringe <laughs> uh, but anyway if you're going in as a novice cook don't get too overwhelmed because you are a beginner. Like anything, if you're starting to run, if you're starting to play a new game, if whatever you do when you're new at something, you suck. But what's fun is when you see that you're actually evolving and you're getting better. It takes time to get a good feel of how to cook. And for different people, it'll take a different amount of time. But if you've already taken the step to wanting to improve and wanting to cook more, you're on the right way. Have fun with it. Try out some new things. Maybe try and recreate dishes from your favorite restaurants or cafes. Find a way to make it fun for yourself. And don't stress too much. At the end of the day, it's only food and it's not too serious. So yeah, these were my 10 tips of stuff that I wish I knew when I started to cook. And I hope they've been helpful for you. Do you have any tips that you'd like to share? Please leave it in the comments below. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. And yeah, I'll see you soon again. Have a lovely week. Bye.